Okay. Um, welcome to the seminary. Um, Asher is is doing or did what must be done this evening. Um, Amina has music and personal share. Kaylee has opening prayer. Uh, Doctor Mastery is Charlie, I think. And then closing prayer is Preston. Who's on deck? Tomorrow is Seth, and then Kaylee, and then Bar. What's the question to answer for you? Uh, how do I earn Christ's love and help? And today is a band concert. And update your reading. Yeah, do that. Especially Ivy and Chase. I don't make up with you. Have we seen these guys? Let's see, is Chase here? Anybody seen Chase today? I think he'll be late. He'll be here, but a little late. All right. We might have him. No, Zach. Zach's on Zoom. So we, we might have everybody here today. Which hasn't happened for like months that we've had the whole class here on the same day. If that happens, we got to celebrate. Take a picture or something. Um, stalling for you. Let's, Charlie, you ready for doctrinal mastery? Yeah. Yeah? Do you want to right now? Okay. Yeah, let's okay. start with the doctrinal master. So I went with Matthew um, 11, 28 to 30. Okay, quiz time. Ready? Go. What is it? Brett, Matthew 11. You think you know it? You think you know it? Sort of, maybe? Okay, let's see if you're right. What do you think it is? So the Matthew 11 and 5. Is from the Salt in the air, light. I mean, no. Nope. Nope. Mm -hmm. Fail. So Keep trying, Jake. What do you think it is? The yoke. The yoke. Yeah. So I'm gonna read it. Starting at 28. Come unto me, all you that are la that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's pretty powerful, guys. Um, Christ truly is who will offer you rest. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can just be lazy and expect blessings. You have to be proactive. Um, but when you go to church and you take the sacrament and you renew your covenants, you go to the temple, all that is rest from the cares of the world. Um, but it is hard work to follow Christ's teaching. It's not just rest all the time. I have a lot of questions about that. Maybe we'll ask them in a minute. Uh, it seems like those who are disciples of Jesus Christ are very productive. Doesn't sound like an easy thing. It can be very busy. Um, hmm. Thanks. Matthew 11. Take my yoke upon you. Don't forget it. Maybe think of the two, the 11 as like yoke or something together. That's how I'm remembering that one. Nina? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> let there be music. Um, how are you, what do you think you want to play a song for you? Um, 144, super fair. 144? Don't, oh, you this one's sort of, uh, you can almost add to this one. It's like a fiddle thing. Okay, are we singing this, 144? Uh, what do you want to do? Watching. you got to open. Yeah, Chase is already halfway there. Okay, then, yes. I am there. Today. He already got there, 144. I was there for a minute. But you should not. Right. Okay, I'm not going to we're gonna, no, I won't. I'll move it. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's we're going to hear you sing a solo. I'll turn it out to the gen pop out here. Huh? I'm going to hear you sing a solo, Chase.
because um, right now my mom and my two older siblings who are at home, um, they are in Utah because my cousin is getting married. And so it's just me and my sister Reagan pretty much babysitting with my dad. Um, and I've just, I've realized how difficult parenting is because <laughs> I've had to take on a lot of responsibility that I don't normally have um, or, you know, as much. Um, and so it's been pretty difficult. So I've been waiting and waiting for my mom to get back home. But um, there was something that went wrong when they were coming back. So they were going through Idaho and um, they were stuck in Idaho for a while um, and it extended their trip like three days. And so hopefully my mom will get home today. But um, I remember we all, like with my family, we all um, knelt down and prayed that they will get home safely. and. Um, quickly since their trip was extended because three days is kind of a lot um, and so hopefully they'll get back today but um, I wanted a song about prayer because I think it's very important to pray and even if sometimes um, things don't go the way that you want in the end though you know you'll get the thing that you need the most and I think that um, I've needed this experience myself to be able to um, Kind of be more grateful for my mom and my parents and what they do for me and my family because it's it's pretty hard to take care of like seven kids that are younger than you so yeah but i'm thankful for my parents and i'm thankful for prayer and yeah mm -hmm. in the name of jesus christ yeah. Amen. Uh, i like the many things that you said you may not get what you want, but the wise Amina, you will always get what you need. Mick Jagger. <laughs> Different context, but True, nonetheless, if you involve the Lord, this is true. Things might not always go your way. For sure, they're not. But that might be a good thing. Imagine that. Um, why do you think prayer helps do that when you're stressed like that? If you take the time to pray, you're stopping everything to talk to God. And I think that if you're willing to do that, then I think that he would be willing to listen to you. Sometimes it can be hard to like stop everything, especially when you're busy and you have things to do. And how, you didn't even say anything about how God's going to help you. You said that prayer is useful because it makes you pause and take a still moment. That in itself can be really beneficial. And you said that God listens. You didn't say God does anything. So, so far, prayer is really useful because prayer creates a peaceful moment, a pause in the mayhem, right? And God listens. How is it helpful to know that God listens? Whether God responds or does your bidding for you, whether God becomes your butler to be bossed around by you, what is the value of God just listening? You don't have to answer. What does anybody think? How does it help to take a pause and to be heard? How is that useful when things are kind of crazy? Have you experienced that before? The power of somebody listening to you, whether they say anything 
or solve your problem. Okay, good. That's great. How many of you are um, verbal processors? Like it helps to talk through something. If you're having a problem, you're stressed out, it helps to just talk, just talk, just like get words out, talk about your problem. And in the talking, you sort of figure a few things out. Does that help anybody? Some people are built that way. They, they're, some people are built more to have this internal dialogue within themselves, this sort of talking back and forth in their mind about working through things. Some people don't, aren't built that way so much. And so it helps to verbalize. That's why like in a lot of relationships, like men and women, like, and it's not all just men and women, but it's it sometimes plays out this way is like person one describes their problem sounds like complaining or whining or whatever person two is like, okay, that's not that much fun. Let's solve the problem. Let's just get it done. Let's just solve the problem. And person one's like, no, I don't want you to solve my problem. I just want you to hear me out and listen to my problem. That's all you need to do so that I am what? So I'm not alone. So that um, I can work out the solution through verbalizing my problem. Does this, land, does this make sense to you? Like different people are built different ways. So when you get in a relationship with somebody who wants to verbally process, let it happen. Don't think you have to solve the problem. Because God may not be there to solve your problem. You'd be there to solve your own problem. But just in taking a peaceful moment, breathing, talking, sharing, you get the sense that I'm not alone. Somebody cares. And in the discussion, I've sort of understood more about the nature of my problem and the solution. Prayer is very useful, whether or not God does exactly what you want him to do. It's very powerful. Yeah. Rule processing leads to solutions. Any thoughts or comments about that? Great, thank you. Uh, I was just talking yesterday to a young friend, a former student, who is just feeling quite overwhelmed. There's a lot going on, a tremendous amount. And there's social pressure and there's academic pressure and there's work and then there's future life coming up and all kinds of decisions that have to be made. And it just feels like I want to just run and hide and disappear. I just want to get away from all of the pressure and just escape. Uh, and I think that's pretty natural when a person starts to get overwhelmed. But the one of the unfortunate things and it's natural too is like not feeling very happy with all the overwhelm kind of feeling down and burdened and um, and church is becoming an additional stressor. Like I go to church and people are like, oh, what's wrong? You don't look happy. You're not smiling as much as you used to. And it just becomes this thing where like she has to feel like she has to explain to people or doesn't even want to deal with it, right? I don't even, I don't want to have to um, go and smile at everybody and make everybody feel happy that I'm happy. It's like I'm having a bad, a difficult time right now. And so a tendency is to want to also push church aside because it's an additional stress or pressure. Um, what would you say, because of the scripture Charlie shared about this yoke business and being yoked with Christ and how he says that his burden is light, and his yoke is easy. I wouldn't say it seems that way to me all the time with the amount of hours of church service that I've given and charitable giving not related to church service. That is also part of my discipleship of caring for the poor and needy. It's not easy. So 
what answer would you have for this former student who's going through an overwhelmed time? Jaron. Well, I feel like it's just like, it's easy for what you get at the end. Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth it. What is the reward that you get at the end by yoking yourself to Christ? Heaven, it's God. Mm -hmm. You're going to be with God. And what's that going to be like there? That you, how you imagine it. Why is that worth it? Being with God. What? Okay, you get peace, happiness. happiness, rest at that point, right? So I'm going to slog through this tough mother of life. I'm going to just get through this. I'm going to do my best to keep my covenants, honor my covenants, and develop this relationship with Christ um, so that in the end, I can receive what the Father has prepared for me, for the faithful. Okay, I hear you. Anybody else agree or disagree or have something to add to that? Very good, Jaron. Yeah. I don't think it has to be like that. It's just super difficult. And then you just wait until you die so you can have all that stuff. So like the rest comes after death, Jaron? Is that so in the end, the end being death, then after that, I don't think that's, that's when how, you get the peace. I don't think that's how God set it up. I don't think that's how he wants it. He wants you to have peace in this life, and you can't. It's just a matter of not being stressed out. Isn't taking on a lot of stuff? Isn't trying to be a high achiever? Isn't trying to do your best? Take like, yeah, be you stressful? You how do you then get through? How, how do you guys get through difficult times when you have a bunch on your plate and it's all seems to be piling up? And where is, what is the mechanism for peace now, not peace later? And I think you're right, but also you're right. We can have peace now. We don't just have to wait to the future reward. How is it possible to be in it now, in the fight, down in the trenches, in the muck, in the, I like, you know, getting it done and still have a sense of, just peace in, in the crazy town. Have you experienced that before? Jesus is trying to get us to believe that it's possible. He's saying this is possible for you to be very busy, take on tremendous responsibilities, shoot for the very best you can become, be very interested in all of your points where you're imperfect and work on them. Be very interested in blessing everybody around you all the time. All right, like he's interested in you doing all those things and have it not be burdensome and stressful and overwhelming. Follow up, Charlie? I think you need to just do everything with Christ as the, the center of your focus. You should lose Christ as the focus and um, then his gospel and whatever. Then you start to get shaky. Mm -hmm. But if Christ is your rock, and everything you do revolves around that. Mm -hmm. Everything you do will have a reason. Mm -hmm. It won't seem pointless. Okay. Can you can you put Christ at the center of all of the busy things and the good things you're doing? We've had this discussion a few times in here, right? Where's the kingdom of God on the track field? Where's the kingdom of God in your math studies? Where's the kingdom of God in your golf swing? Where, like he says, seek him first in all things, and then everything else you need will be added unto you. Well, how do you seek him? How do you focus on him in all those little things, all the day-to-day -day endeavors? And that's what he's wanting us to figure out. And I agree that it's possible. And when you can do that, everything feels like it settles in. The things that are too much or you don't need, they tend to fall away out of your life. Um, I just want to put that there, that you can achieve this, and that it's possible by putting him first. Peter, what made Peter falter when he was walking on water? He was doing something amazing. And you all are trying to do something amazing, especially you are taking on a lot trying to live a big full life and achieve a lot and but what made him start to sink who knows the story 
At what point did he start to go under? Yeah. When there were lots, when there was lots of people. Okay. Okay. Right. How would he notice all of those things? Yeah. As soon as his focus went away from the one who was walking on the water, his lifeguard, right? Then, then he noticed all the problems and started to sink and get and drown in the chaos and, and the, the stress and the pressure. Um, so good. If you're struggling, don't turn away from God. Turn toward him. Uh, and just sit there in prayer and talk about your problems. I promise that if you do, you'll feel more peace and you'll get more answers, more solutions to the, the, the situations you're facing. Because if it's true for them, it's true for me. It's true for me because I've experienced my life. It's true for you. Comments or questions there? All right, open up to Matthew 8 and 9. And I want you to turn to your neighbor quickly and answer this question. The one who's next to you, starting here. How do I earn Christ's love and help? Go, go. You guys, faster. He might be back in a minute. Okay, let's see how this works out here, you guys. You, you guys, where are you? Where's the chat? It's always on this. Yeah, Matthew 8 and 9. You know, we to we know we'll be back momentarily. Grant, I think you yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I really just want to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. How do you manage Christ's love and help? I mean, uh, yeah. How do you do it? How do All right. How do you earn God's love? Bar? We've all earned it? How? Well, I love this all. How did you earn it then? I guess God doesn't love others more than you because, like, I guess God loves people that sin without knowing. Like, if they sin in anger, in your ignorance, yes, <laughs> um, He will love you the same as them. So, so God's love is Christ's love is always consistent and always there. So, what do you have to do to earn it? Nothing. Just be here. You just have to exist. That's it. You just have to have been created by him. That's it. Because he loves the things he made. You're one of his things. You're one of his little creatures. And he loves all of his little things he made. And you're one of those sweet little precious little things. No matter what you do, you're one of those. Yeah. No, he did. He does. He does. He loves everything he made. Sorry. It was a trick question. Oh, you're... Yeah. yeah. Quick comments. Yeah? I feel like... I agree with what Jacob said because we all we all at some point in the criminal existence chose to come to Earth. So, so I I think that in some way or another, because we exist, like you said, that He loves us because we did choose to come. Mm -hmm. You think God loves those who didn't choose? No, I think he loves them. I just, I just think that he's giving us an opportunity 
Because when you love someone, you're always going to try to work harder for them to succeed or for them to do better. And those two are going to choose your family when you date. So. Okay, cool. Something to add to that? Seth, you had a hand, and then James? Um, I agree with what you said, but also I think in Matthew chapter 8, like the first eight verses, mm -hmm. um, this guy really wanted this. Like he kind of put that work into. He wanted the love or he wanted the help? Um, I mean, it's clear that I think here he wanted the help because he had leprosy. Um, but I also think he wanted that love too. Mm -hmm. um, they assumed the love was there or they wouldn't go asking. It's like, oh, this guy hates me. It's not going to help me. That's probably not what they were thinking. Oh, Jesus is loving. Jesus is willing. Jesus is helping people. Then he might help me. Yeah. Good. I was just going to bring up your same. Okay, same point. Yeah. But what about the help? The help part. And that's what I want to get to in this Matthew 8 and 9. The question that we have to ask ourselves do miraculous miracles still happen today? I mean, miracle with a big M or miracle with a small M? Because I heard when you guys did your miracle shares, some said that, well, Jesus, he'll help, well, he'll help you, but wait. He, but you might not get a miracle miracle, but he'll still help you in some way. Like, you might not get the withered hand healed. You might not get the, you know, the whatever the ailment or the problem is resolved, but he'll still help you somehow. Does it still happen? Do the same miracles still happen today? Casting out devils, healing of the sick, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, meaning it can't speak. I mean, I think that like nowadays there's a lot more like, we have a lot more modern medicine, which I think has come through like, how like we're just like given it, given it by God, but like, it's obviously from God, like it on earth is from God, but like we have these like much more advanced medic medical technologies, whereas like back then it's like you got a cut on your hand, you could have got infected and had to die. Mm. Nowadays that's like not a big deal for us. So like okay. maybe some of the like more medical side of stuff is like I don't know. We don't need God as much because we got us, right? No, we're pretty we're great. Still, Look what we can do. <laughs> Thanks, God. You gave us all the brains and all the intelligence, but now we're good. We got it sorted out. You know, you did your job. We'll take it from here. That's not what you're saying, but it kind of sounds like, in a way, like yeah. the miracles are done by people now through modern medicine. How do we get the medicine? How do we get the intelligence to develop it? Where did the burgeoning of all the explosion all the, of all the awesome things start to happen? With the restoration. Look at what's happened since 1820. It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Or, well, and actually going back to like Christ time, actually. But you had a comment and you did. Holly and then Um, I was just going to like wonder, this is like purely guessing, but I wonder if some of the, well, we know that miracles still happen, but I wonder if some of them aren't quite as visible just because, you know, in the era of technology, we need to record something and send it. That might take away someone's opportunity to have faith. Um, not to say that seeing miracles, I mean, like uh, Wayne and Lemuel in the Book of Mormon saw crazy things and they still didn't believe. Um, but if I wonder if things were seen like online, it would maybe still take away the chance for some people to have like a straight faith. So maybe it is just more private miracles or even not quite as visible. Okay. Um, don't, if so if, if don't see them, equals you have to have an increase of faith maybe or trust yeah, for that. No, that that's a good thought it requires some more exploring and things because we've got a bunch already right here in front of us charlie and then Bridget. well exorcism still happens it's a pretty big in thing. scary movies well, no, 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 that's what i was gonna say my brother tell me okay if you're i've heard stories the priest sees the child floating off the ground that stuff is <laughs> No, it's real stuff. Okay. Though. All I know. Okay. My brother, yes. when he came back from his mission, he was like, "Yeah, we did like a couple exorcisms, and like they were, like, were convinced that their son was like." That's what I'm saying. Wait, so, that's a thing. Yes, they I can do that. Yeah. You can, get you can do that. We got this, God. 
thanks anyway. Don't mess with the Ouija board. We can do it. We can do it. mess you up. Okay. Yeah, Jake did like, I think he said five. And like, no, Exorcism is a big like, scary word that might not necessarily explain exactly what's going on because it brings up all these images of yeah, terror horror movies. Like the movies but... Not at all. It, wasn't it was like same idea. That's exactly what it is, though. Floating, vomiting frogs and all that. Stuff. <laughs> oh, it's, <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. it's legit. Okay. Um, this so is where we're going. All right. Um, both both and Todd, like both served in like Washington D.C. or mm-hmm. even there, they like both have like passed out like unclean spirits and stuff. Yeah. But then, like, my dad, when he went to Brazil, and there was, like, a lot more, like, witchcraft and stuff that, like, they believe in down there. And basically, they're just, like, relying on, like, bad spirits to do what we would, like, have good spirits, like, the Holy Ghost do and stuff. Why would a bad spirit do a good thing? Um, well, like, to convince, like, sometimes, like, to convince you that, like, oh, it might be a good spirit. So, like, they think that, like, it's an alternative option, so they, like... So it gives them some kind of sign or something, and they're like, oh, this must be a good spirit. And then they like mm-hmm. just like let that into their lives. But mm-hmm. my dad like barely talks about it because it was like such a crazy, like he mm-hmm. can't even explain it, so he doesn't want to like talk mm-hmm. about it because he like mm-hmm. I don't know. But he, he did it through those, yeah. Okay. Think of it like this a little bit. Say this is God, this is the true God here, and this is us. And there's something in us that makes us want to believe in God, right? There's something in us that reaches toward God. We naturally believe in God. We don't have to convince ourselves. That we naturally believe in God unless we get convinced otherwise. Sort of. So what, if Satan is really intent on keeping you from the true and living God, is he going to try to convince you that there is no God at all? How much success will he have saying there is no God? Very little. Because most people have an innate sense that there's a higher power at least. So what he's going to try to do is get you to believe in this God right over here. And just take you a little bit off the mark by degrees until you believe in something that can't actually help you. Um, So there's that. But I do want to say, since we're on this topic, and it wasn't necessarily going to be the topic, but it is now because we're almost out of time, and that's fine. Y'all are just trying to delay your parable shares. I know what you're up to. <laughs> but let's deal with this. Uh, is, is Lucifer real? Yes. Yeah. How much power? So that's unanimous. We all believe that if there's a God, there's also a devil. If there's a Christ, there's also a Lucifer. Right? There's Jehovah, there's Lucifer, there's Christ, there's Satan. Wait, what? Hmm? Those are two different what? Satan and Lucifer. They're the same, but the, in different contexts. Pre-mortally, Christ was known as Jehovah, right? And pre-mortally, Satan was known as Lucifer. That was his name. Okay. You're good. Okay, so, so we believe that that's a thing. The question is, how much power does the devil and his angels, his demons, have in the mortal world? Can human beings communicate with them? Yes or no? Can, do they have physical power to influence us physically and the material world around us? Yes. Do you believe so? All you have to do is read here, and you'll have your answer. Okay, you're thinking of Joseph Smith, binding his tongue, surrounding him by doctrines, filling him with depression, despair even, hopelessness, and not able to speak. That's a great example. We got we got demons and pigs, all right? And That's there too. There's dragons. Dragons, okay. Unicorns, giants, okay. Oh, let's, let's leave those aside There's for There's actually now. dragons in the scriptures. Fiery serpents, but that was something God, right? Well, God created all nature, didn't God? So if it's in nature, then God made it. Okay, so so the devil's real. The devil is smart. Well, it's really stupid, but very intelligent. 
the same time because he's fighting a losing battle, but he believes in what he's doing very, very intently, very convinced that he's doing the right thing. That's how he's so tenacious because he's, his cause he believes is just. Okay, so he's not given up easily. He's not just a rebel without a cause. <laughs> he's very sure that he's doing something that is actually important and useful. Um, does he have power over the physical world? He doesn't have a body. They don't have bodies, right? So how could a nothing inf like influence a material something? Well, like I know that, like I have had family members who've had like an experience with like angels and like they were in a car crash and like the angels like surrounded her and she was mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Can't is that not a thing with like that woman? Okay, it's so a, so are were those angels spirits? <laughs> we'll say they are. Okay. So do are spirits a real thing? Joseph Smith taught us in the Doctrine and Covenants that all uh, spirit is matter. Spirit is matter. It's not just a vapor or just an imaginary ghosty sort of see-through sort of thing. Spirit is matter. It's matter just like anything that you think is material that's matter. So is spirit. It's just a refined matter. And were our eyes refined enough to discern it, we would see it easily all around us. We are just not in a state where we can perceive such a thing. But we'll get there eventually if we keep attracting more light and truth to us. We'll eventually get to that point where we learn how to do that. Okay, so Satan and his angels are physical, just a different kind of physical. So they have power to influence physical things. It is true. All kinds of things, emotionally, psychologically, in your body, in the material world around us. They do have power to influence and to afflict and to torment man and women, but mankind, right? So knowing that is the case, then are such things as possessions a real thing? It seems like Jesus spent half of his time casting out demons and healing people who were possessed, right? Afflicted with the devil. Is that still happening? And we've heard a few examples of yes, and I myself have experienced that, and I never thought that I would. I myself have experienced the direct influence of evil spirits, and I've known that that's what that was in a physical way. So I, I can tell you from my own experience, we talked about testimony yesterday, I can give my witness, I have my own experiences in my testimony suitcase of the reality of the of the darkness and those individuals that support it and um, try to influence us with that power so is this going to scare you i don't know but it's good to be a little scared of the right things <laughs> because it's real and i've known people who have opened up that door to communication with um, evil or unclean spirits, which are different things, on the other side, and then not been able to shut that door once they opened it. That's very, very scary. And they came to us as missionaries and explaining the problem and were able to use the power of the priesthood, which is faith in Jesus Christ, to help this young guy. And that's not the only time that happened. I've also experienced the, the casting out or the cleansing of a physical space like a home or a person, which is also a physical space. Um, so these things still do happen. They're not published as widely, but they're held in personal lives. And miracles, the same kinds of miracles we've seen here are the same kind of miracles that still happen. Don't believe, don't disbelieve that you through your faith, can receive real, capital M, miracles. Don't know if tomorrow we'll get into eight and nine, but we're going to look at the question, and I'll leave you with the circumstances leading up to Jesus' miracles. Find the formula and put it to the test, A plus B equals C, because if it works for them, it works for me. 
So I want to look at the specific circumstances of just a few miracles in, in 8 and 9, and let's see what were the circumstances, what were the antecedents, the things that happened leading up to this event, and get an understanding of how do we invite these kinds of miracles into our own lives. I promise you that Christ is able, and I promise you that he is responsive to you and to your needs. And he's very real and he's very close. And leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you.